Free gift, you guys. I'm giving away my Mastering Portraits DVD. I did this in 2007, before Bishop Rotary existed, which is why you won't see me using a bishop in this video. This is gonna be on YouTube. Check it out, it's three full hours, uncut. You get to watch the whole thing. I, mean, I know a lot of you guys and girls are down right now, you're drawing, you're not tattooing, at least you shouldn't be. Um, but hey, now you guys get to check out a cool DVD for free. Even though this was filmed in 2007, the techniques still apply today. You're gonna learn in this DVD when to approach a tattoo, when you're ready for a portrait, because you gotta be ready. You're gonna learn how to breathe, proper breathing technique, proper line and shading techniques, proper ways to make your stencil. I'm unpacking so many goodies in here that you guys are gonna be amazed. If you guys have any questions about the DVD, drop a comment on the YouTube page or send us a DM or a uh, email. I enjoy teaching, privilege to be able to give this to you guys for free. Uh, if you were one of the fortunate people that got a hold of this 13 years ago, 12 years ago, 10 years ago, before, you know, lots of techniques were on YouTube, uh, you know what this is all about, and uh, tell a friend. Like I said, you guys enjoy this, it's on me, it's my gift to you. What's happening, I'm Fieldy from Corn. Um, Franco's done some work on me. He's dope, man, you guys check it out. How you doing? This is Franco Vescovi. Uh, I've been tattooing for 16 years. I have a shop called Orange County Ink House in Lake Forest, California. Today we're going to be talking about portraits and uh, my version of them and how I think they should be done. And uh, we're going to go over a lot of bases. We're going to cover a lot of techniques, a lot of tricks to pulling these portraits off. There's a lot of uh, talk about how to do portraits and there's uh, quite a few ways to do them. But uh, the way I've chosen to do my portraits is uh, from a lot of influence from Jack Rudy, Bob Tyrell, and just different people along the way. Over the years, I've developed a lot of techniques and kind of fine-tuned them for myself. And I would uh, just like to share them with you guys and see what you guys can do with them. And I can promise you, if you guys use all the techniques that we talk about, uh, your, all your portraits and all of your tattoos will be advanced uh, 100%. Uh, it's just a matter of applying them. It's just a matter of making sure that you know that this hits home with you and uh, overall I think that uh, if we watch closely the video and uh, listen to what we're talking about uh, you'll definitely see results in your uh, next tattoo almost guaranteed. I can't stress enough how important it is for you guys to understand that uh, this video is not for every tattoo artist this video isn't meant for anybody just to pick up a machine after they watch this and attempt a portrait there's some things we have to cover before you're able to do these portrait tattoos and there has to be a sense of honesty that you can have with yourself to make sure that you're comfortable with even attempting a portrait. Um, this isn't for amateurs, this isn't for people that just started tattooing. I think three to five years is probably the minimum uh, someone could even you know, watch a tape like this to, to uh, attempt a portrait. On that note, you know, there's going to be a lot of techniques and tricks that we're going to cover today that's going to kind of get you feeling a lot more comfortable with your portrait tattoos and uh, you know it's gonna make it's gonna definitely make a difference in your in your career all you gotta do is listen and apply these techniques a portrait is an exact representation of a piece that someone brings in it's different than any type of fantasy tattoo we do sacred hearts butterflies freehand skulls all that stuff you rely on your imagination and that's good that's 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 a great other form of tattooing but portraits you can't use your imagination you can't use any of your any of your fantasy type of mentality on a portrait you have to learn and this is one of the main problems in portraits that I see you have to learn to separate that you have to learn to not rely on your imagination and to not rely on your interpretation of a, of a face or a portrait when you do a portrait you're literally painting or drawing or tattooing only what you see the piece I chose is Alfred Hitchcock because a number of reasons if you look at this piece I'm going to be able to show you how to do glass, wood, flesh tone, fabric, hair, wrinkles, contrasting shadows, personality, all the components you'll need to do any portrait tattoo, or any tattoo for that matter. Now I'm going to show you guys one of the most critical parts of the portrait tattoo, and that is a stencil. So I'm going to place my reference on top of the carbon paper. Now all the techniques that are out there, this is one I find to be the easiest. It's more hands-on, it's more direct. I mean, you're literally tracing on top of the reference, leaving your stencil marking on the back. 
I like to use a number seven lead pencil just to have a soft touch. Keep it in mind, you're going to want to capture every single element of detail you can. This is pretty much going to be your road map for the stencil. You want to make sure you capture every element of detail. I'm going to work on the face right now, you guys, and uh, get in every element possible. Your porch is going to be really only as good as your stencil. I mean, especially when you're doing something so exact. If it's going to be something exact, then you want to get it as exact as possible. One of the reasons why I like to do it this way, there's no worrying about registration or being off registration as far as the stencil is concerned. You could move this all around, and it's still going to be exactly what you need it to be. There's a lot of different techniques to pick up shadowing. Mine's kind of like, I like to do lines and dots. So when I put the stencil on, it kind of reminds me that whatever's lined or dotted is a shadow. You want to pick up every amount of detail. I mean, not leaving anything out. You want to fine tooth comb this thing. Make it perfect. Little elements right there. Get into the nooks and crannies. All this information is important. Like I said, even though you have your reference right in front of you, you have to keep in mind, you want to align your reference with your stencil. It makes it a lot easier than not having the information there because you're doing a portrait tattoo. You're not doing a portrait painting or drawing. Something like that you can come up to the next day and correct or you can erase or you can paint over. But when you're dealing with skin, there's no cheating. There is no shortcut. You know, if you're doing a portrait drawing or a portrait painting, you know, you can come back to those things and fix them up and change them around. But you got one shot at a portrait tattoo. There's no eraser. There's no room for error. Very important to make sure you pick a good reference. Make sure you pick a piece that's detailed enough. You want to see a crisp piece. You want to make sure that it's just basically detailed enough to where you can see crisp eyes and mouth and things like that. You want to make sure that you pick the right portrait. A lot of times I'll have the customer bring back another piece if it doesn't work. Very important to dot where the highlights are going to be. I definitely choose the dot method on that. It just tells me once again when you flip it over and Definitely put it on the skin. When you see those dots, it implies that they're highlights. Now this stencil is going to take me a while, and keep in mind, it's a catch-22. The longer it takes to make the stencil, the quicker your tattoo will be. The quicker it takes to make your stencil, the longer the tattoo will take. Why? Because you're going to have to constantly reference back and forth because you didn't lay your roadmaps down properly. So very important to lay your roadmaps down very proper, getting every inch of detail. You know, for example, I didn't get that last part of the nose right there. But one of the ways you want to double check, you want to flip this around and lay this on a light table. You know, any light table will work. You just want to lay it on a light table. You want to look through the painting, or the reference, I should say. You want to make sure that you got every ounce of detail. For example, obviously I got this eye. I didn't get that eye yet. You know, if I was to lay this on a light table, I, I would see that. But that goes for every little nook and cranny and wrinkle. You just want to basically nail every amount of detail. We'll flip it back over. Start on the other eye. Remember one thing as well. Don't try to add your own input to this piece. Don't try to add your own style to your eyes or to your lips or how you do things. You want to do it exactly what you see. Nothing else. Obviously what I'm about to tell you guys, you guys probably already know, but when a client or a customer comes in and they bring an original, you want to make a copy of that. Before you start the stencil, just Nail down the size options with your client and make sure that you're not doing it on the original. On that note, you want to make a copy at uh, a place like Kinko's or a place that has a photocopier machine, something that can give you enough detail that you need. Definitely not a standard machine, not a standard copy machine will do. Something else to talk about is sometimes a client will bring in a picture that's not workable. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of tattoo artists out there that will still attempt to do the tattoo. All I can say is I won't do that. Uh, the other day I had a client come in and she brought a portrait of her grandpa the size of a quarter. I looked at it and I knew it wouldn't blow up right. I knew it wouldn't be enough detail when I enlarged it in the coffee machine. But uh, just to kind of show her what I was talking about, I enlarged it. And uh, yeah, sure enough, it came out really blurry. It was pretty much undoable. She was really adamant about the piece. You know, she was trying to talk me into it. And I basically said, look, there's no way to talk me into doing this piece. It's just not going to work. So just make sure that you guys are always firm with your customers when you know that it's not going to work. It's better to not do a wrong portrait than to do it and have it not come out the way you want. So never ever be afraid to make the customer go search for uh, better references. Grab that highlight on the nose right there. I mean, I'm spending a lot, a lot of time on the face here. And keep in mind, this face isn't that big. Let's go ahead and turn it around and see what we got. I 
Actually, let's go ahead and jump over here to the glass. Sometimes I'll stop what I'm doing, I'll jump over to something else, and then what that does is it kind of pulls me into something new so that when I go back to the face, I'll immediately see things that I didn't get. So we're going to go to the glass right here, approaching it the same way as we did the face. Same thing with the reflections, I like to use the dots. This isn't your average face, it's not just a face, so we got all these elements. So this stencil is going to take a little bit longer, but keep in mind I would say your average size stencil would probably be about the size of your hand, closed fist, and a face that size, you should spend at least 20 to 30 minutes on a stencil. I mean, literally master it like you're a photocopy machine. Hand stencils is the way to go for me, there's a lot of other ways to do them, but when you do a hand stencil versus tracing it and putting it through a stencil machine, you just have more control. You know, for example, I, I could move this any way I want, and it's still going to come out exactly perfect. You know what I mean? There's no registration issues to worry about like you would have if you were tracing this with uh, tracing paper. So a good 20 to 30 minutes is what you want to spend on your average portrait stencil. This right here, however, will probably take me 45 minutes. This button is dark right there. There's nothing right there. It picks up again some dark shadows, disappears. There's two little dots that imply some shadowing. Then you got the four holes where the thread goes through. These two top ones are sort of bleeding together in the photograph. Sort of the same in the bottom. Now in reality, these four holes that the thread goes through, they're spaced apart evenly. But you gotta tell yourself you're doing what you see, not what you know to be correct. I'll see people do stencils of portraits. They'll just leave a lot of information out. They'll just kind of rush the stencil, or they'll do their own version of the stencil. For example, in their mind, they'll see lines. And on the reference, it's exact lines. But what they'll do is they'll go towards their mind and just start doing lines. And uh, we cannot do that. If you want to be a great portrait artist, you have to do only what you see. Portrait tattoos are stressful. They really can take it out of you. I mean, usually when I do a portrait, that's the only tattoo I do for the day. The reason why it takes a lot out of you is because you're doing it the right way. Obviously, if you get done quick or it didn't take that much to do it, you're not going to be winded. But I'll tell you what, when you do a portrait the right way, you're going to be winded. So we're going to be working on the stencil for another half an hour or so. We're going to go ahead and put all of our energy into the stencil, and then we're going to go ahead and start the tattoo. Now that we have the stencil done, the best way to cut the stencil out would be to cut it out from the back so that way you can kind of make sure you don't overcut or undercut the stencil because the less paper you have around it easier it is to apply especially when you're measuring an area so I'm cutting around the stencil really close like I said before the less extra paper you have the easier it is to apply on the skin it makes it easier to measure and when you're doing a portrait, your whole goal is to make it easy as possible on you because portraits are the hardest tattoo to do. And sometimes the stress can make you not do your best job. So you're basically trying to cut out the stress with as many tricks as you know about. So before I would even make the stencil, one thing to consider is just measurements. Measure the piece with a copy machine, blow it up a, a few different sizes that you think that might be the best size. And then you'll measure the skin, you know. When I say measure, we're talking about eyeballing, kind of putting copies on the skin and, and measuring it such like this. Okay, now what we're going to do is uh, once the stencil's done, one little trick I learned a long time ago is just to give it some stress points by little cuts like that. So when you wrap it around the skin, it folds a little bit easier without distorting the stencil because if the stencil's not put on right, it can affect the final outcome of the piece. Now, before I start the tattoo, definitely want to talk about why I have two different references. I have a dark reference that I turned up the contrast on the computer before I printed it so that I could see every possible nook and cranny of the shading. That way, I could make sure that the end result has as much detail as possible. Then I have the lighter version so that I could see 
what the darker version didn't give me, the, the details and the darks and the shadows. Something like this where there's a, there's a lot of black and a lot of dark, you want to have two different references just to kind of compare the two and give yourself as much information as possible so that when you're referencing, you can go off of both. So now that we got the light and the dark reference, I'm ready to go. Now I can give myself as much information as I need to pull this off correctly. Your outcome is only as good as your stencil is. When you're doing a portrait, it's one of those tattoos where you don't want to have to rely on freehand. Although it is possible, it's just more stress and more time for the tattoo. One more note about your photo reference. You want to make sure that your reference is detailed and you want to make sure that you know that the reason why that is is because it's only going to come out as good as your reference. What I mean by that is sometimes people come in with a small portrait. By the time you blow it up, it's fuzzy. And there's a lot of people that attempt portraits out there from bad reference and then they are not happy with their final result. There's only one way to do a portrait and it's called the right way. It has to be exactly like it or you as an artist aren't going to feel like you did your best job. Now to apply the stencil, my favorite stuff is uh, it's called stencil stuff. You can get it online, stencilstuff.net. The reason why I like this stuff, uh, there's a lot of products out there, but what I found with this product is that, especially on a portrait, you don't want to lose your stencil. Everybody that's been tattooing can uh, remember the times when they've lost their stencil. It's all right when you're doing a rose or a heart, something you could for sure freehand right away to fix, but when you're doing a stencil, you don't want to lose anything because then you're sacrificing the final outcome. So this stuff really, really makes it stick, it really makes it stay as long as you need it to. Okay, now that I've measured his leg previously, uh, we're just going to put it on. I like working on legs just for that reason. It's just a good, good area to cover. Gently put it on, just kind of let it hit in the middle. Kind of hold it there, not really in a rush. You don't, you don't want to bend it. I usually put the middle on and I fold either the left or right side, doesn't matter. What this does is it ensures you're not going to distort your stencil. After I fold the right side, I'll pick it up a little bit just to give it some give. And then I'll start to fold the other side. Remembering that the better the stencil is, the better the final result will be. Now that right there is perfect. Okay, put my Andy ointment right there, just so I have it in front of me. Preparing the skin. I like to put a thin layer of Andy ointment over the tattoo area that I'm about to work on, just to kind of prep the skin, get it all ready for me. We're going to go ahead and start in the center. There's so many different types of blacks. There's always talk of what's better, Pelican or Talons. I think they're both great. I just use Pelican. I use it for the fact that it just seems to be a little bit easier and thinner to work and your grays seem to come out a little bit more smooth. This is a Bug Pin 10 needle and it's a 11 mag in a 9 mag tube. What that means is the needle's a little bit smaller. I'm sure people are familiar with the Bug Pins versus the regular number 12s. But I use the Bug Pin 10s. Uh, I got I got introduced uh, from Bob Tyrell that technique and uh, the needles are smaller so it basically leaves smaller holes in the skin and if you have a bunch of smaller holes it's that whole uh, concept of it looking more gradient and more faded and more shaded nicely versus the bigger holes. You can still pull off tattoos just fine with the number 12s but for me personally the number 10s just do it a little bit easier. Okay now we're going to start the tattoo and uh, once again going to go into it with my shader needle but keep in mind, I'm doing a lot of the simple shading, simple meaning the clothing, the items that aren't super detailed such as the buttons or like the nose and eyes. So since we're going to be doing things that aren't really detailed, we're going to go in with the shader. When we get to the fingers, we're still going to use a shader, but what we're going to do is we're going to switch to the outline machine after we're done with this area to do tight cleanups. So here we are, we're going to go ahead and start. Uh, also, one thing to consider is a lot of people don't take advantage of their needles as far as multi-use and angles. And what I mean by that is this is a 11 mag shader, bug pin, 10. But to me, it's also a single needle. It's also a three tight. It's also a seven tight, depending on how I angle it. Right now, I'm going into this as a single needle, so I'm going to just barely use the tip. I learned this from the master, Bob Tyrell. He definitely has this down pat.
And don't be afraid to uh, change your angle. It's kind of like getting a haircut as a kid. If you remember when you were a kid getting your hair cut, the barber just kind of shifts you around, changes the angle of your head. You know, because for her it has to be right. So she's not concerned about you. She's concerned about how to move your head so it makes her job better to make sure you get a good haircut. Same with tattooing. You have to angle this machine to get your final result. Sometimes if you feel like not doing that, you can sacrifice the quality. A lot of times you'll see a portrait and when you zoom in you look really close, it's a little loose. Okay, so now that we talked about the angles and how to get tightly into the grooves in the tight areas, uh, I'm going to have you just watch me as I do this. I'm going to kind of complete this little section right here using those techniques we just talked about. A lot of you are probably wondering what kind of machine I'm using. It's not your standard tattoo machine, although it's, uh, it was one of the first machines invented as far as uh, it being a rotary. Uh, I've been using rotaries for about nine years, about eight years now. And uh, to me, they have a lot of benefits. I mean, like I said, you could, you could pull off a tattoo with any machine as long as you have the knowledge. But for me, it's just more of a noise factor. The noise is very, very minimal. And when you're working for four or five hours on a piece, there's nothing more annoying than going home and still hearing that ring in your head. Also, it's very light. So as far as your wrist and carpal tunnel, that's kept to a minimum as well. I'm in the process of uh, developing my own rotary machine. Later on, I'll uh, give you the website to find it and uh, see what you guys think of it. You always have to continuously stare at your reference. See, the thing is, is if I'm not looking every 20 seconds, then that means I'm relying on my own imagination to complete the portrait. And when you're doing a portrait, it's something, it's something unlike any other tattoo. You don't, you, don't do your, you don't do your style. There's no such thing as a portrait done your style. A portrait can be done one way and one way only. It's got to look like the picture. That's why it's called a portrait. That's why it's called realism. A lot of times people kind of do their own thing and the end result they don't seem to be happy about. Any other tattoo you put your style and your soul into. But a portrait, you want it to be exactly like the picture. I'm kind of working on the side right here to get that line in there. I'm using the tips of the needle, like we talked about earlier, to shade the tighter areas. And for me, this kind of works like you're having a, uh, a bug pin 5 or a 3 tight. It's the same type of concept. A lot of times people say, you know, how do you do a portrait with a shader machine? without outlining it at first and I tell them I do outline it at first I just happen to know how to use this shader like an outliner but when it comes to the face I have a different approach on it's definitely good to start out with the outliner we'll talk about that when we get to the face as I do a portrait what I like to do first I like to get all the black areas out of the way I like to get as much black done for one reason, it basically tells me, it sets the overall tone and the mood for the portrait. Now I can kind of relay every other tone to the black. So it makes it a little bit easier for me as far as the guessing game of what tones to use. It's a tight corner. So we're going to flip it to a single needle right now, you know, we're going to flip it and just barely work the tip. If you've never tried this technique, I learned it two years ago, so it's not something I've been doing for a long time, uh, but it saves a little bit of time without sacrificing the detail. You never want to save time and sacrifice detail. But if you could save time without sacrificing detail, then why not?
I'm tightly in this area again, once again working the single needle to a three tight. What I mean by that when I say working the single needle or three tight, talking about the angle of the needle. In fact, I'm going to kind of show you guys something right now. You use the tip of it. Now that right there is a single needle. And uh, when I say single, I mean literally it's the single needle. It's the very end. You wipe it away, it's still in there. So with this machine or with this needle, we can get as fine as we need to. Just wanted to point that out. Remember, always looking, always looking at your stencil, always looking at your reference, comparing the two, making sure. I'll talk about something kind of very, very useful to know is breathing techniques. You'll probably see me breathing a lot and wondering why I'm breathing funny. Anything in life, archery, shooting guns, all that stuff, they'll always teach you to breathe when you're, when you're uh, pulling the trigger or whatnot. Tattooing the same way if you're doing something that's stressful and you really have to pull it off perfectly kind of like shooting a perfect arrow breathing really helps it helps your mind be free it relaxes you and those two things make your uh, tattooing ability stronger that's not something you'll hear a lot of people talk about but it's really important A lot of times when you're in, a, in an area, I call it like a like a, a really tough area. Maybe the lines have to intersect exactly like the picture. You'll see me look back and forth a lot. It's just to make sure that I got it correctly before I pull the trigger and make and commit to a line. Keep in mind, this is uh, this definitely isn't an amateur video. It's definitely not meant for people that are just starting a tattoo or just learning how definitely not meant for people that are apprenticing it's meant for people that have been tattooing for years and have already understood the basic fundamentals of doing black and gray tattoos just because in this video I'm not going to teach you how to fade or shade that's something you have to already know how to do to bring to the table to do a portrait also keep in mind portrait tattoos are uh, the most difficult tattoos you can do and it's not something you want to do to somebody unless you know what you're doing I mean me as a portrait artist I can't say that I've never done a portrait without it not being perfect but there's times where when you're learning it's not going to be as good as five years into the into the tattoo career but keep in mind you want to do as much practicing as you can on paper to, to even understand the fundamentals of a portrait which is something I did before I ever did a portrait tattoo, I had been drawing portraits and I understood how they were done before I tried tattooing one. So if this is something you're going to attempt to do, just make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons. You're not, doing, you're not trying to do portraits just to be cool. You're not trying to do portraits just to say you've mastered one of the hardest parts of tattooing. You're doing it because you love portraits and you really want to learn how to do them right. There's a lot of years that go into doing a portrait correctly, a lot of advice. Uh, two of my favorite portrait artists are Jack Rudy, of course, and Bob Tyrell. And uh, both have sort of different styles, but they both nail the portrait. Another technique I use is uh, 
zooming in and zooming in again. And what that means is when you're referencing, you're zooming in mentally, looking really deep and detailed at the portrait reference. But then you're looking beyond that. You're zooming in and you're zooming in again. You're, you're going into the detail factor so deep that it helps you pull out the portrait exactly like the picture. I'm going to say that probably a hundred times in this video, exactly like the picture. Because remember, that's what makes a portrait a portrait. It's got to be exactly like the picture. Only one way to do a portrait, the right way, exactly like the picture. Otherwise, what you have is an attempt at a portrait. And remember one thing, if you're doing a portrait on somebody, they're expecting you to do it and pull it off. They're expecting you, they've trusted you with their skin, they've trusted you with their parents, their kids, their deceased loved ones, whatever portrait you're doing, they've trusted you with it. It's a, it's a very important spiritual experience to get someone's face on you. So when someone allows you the privilege to do a face on them, you don't want to sell them short. You don't, want to con you don't want to convince them that you're a good portrait artist when you're not. And there's nothing wrong with not being a portrait artist. There's nothing wrong with not being a good portrait artist. As long as you learn before you attempt it and cover your basis, once again, learning how to do it on paper first. Taking classes, getting videos. Good place to go for that would be uh, airbrushaction.com. It's the website for Airbrush Action Magazine, great magazine. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of featured artists uh, in the airbrush world that are really, really good. Look out for some videos by uh, Corey St. Clair and another good video uh, out by Steve Driscoll. That guy can do portraits so detailed that he almost never leaves out the hair follicles or the sweat glands on a face. So that's something to know. Remember, you want to zoom in and zoom in again when it comes to portraits. You want to get really detailed. One thing I'd like to bring up, I said before, if you haven't started doing portraits on the skin, or even if you have and you're not happy with the end result, I would just urge you to pull back and to stop doing them until you've really took the time to get some videos and to get some instruction. Because ultimately, you don't want these people coming back two, three years from now wanting to get touched up or fixed up. And it's real hard to fix a portrait. It's almost impossible. Only way you can fix a portrait is if it faded so much that you can't even really see the first one. So just be, just be real mindful of that. Don't be greedy. Don't be selfish. And what I mean by those words is if you're selfish and greedy and you know you can't do a portrait good or how you want it to be, you're going to just be out there attempting to do them, and that's not fair. It's not fair for your own reputation, let alone is it fair for the client who's probably paying you for the portrait. So there's nothing wrong with stopping. I did it myself. There's nothing wrong with stopping your portraits, going back to the drawing board and perfecting it on paper, understanding the elements of it, and then returning to the skin. And maybe you want to start off with what I always suggest to the people that I work with or anyone that asks me about portraits, once you get the fundamentals of a portrait down, don't even jump into a face portrait of a family member of somebody. Jump into a portrait, maybe a character from a horror flick, like uh, you know Frankenstein or something. Something like that to where if it doesn't come out exactly like the picture, it's Frankenstein. There's a bunch of wrinkles and cracks on his face, so no one will, really will ever know, especially if you've already got the fundamentals of tattooing down. So you basically start doing those types of portraits first, and then when you feel comfortable, then you can jump into a face of a family member or somebody that's exact. You know, Even an actor like Robert De Niro or Alfred Hitchcock, he's, he's an exact person. There's no Frankenstein elements to him, so you want to save these types of portraits to after you've been experimenting with characters. And portrait tattoos aren't for everybody. I mean, it's one of those things where I don't necessarily do a lot of color. I don't do colored portraits. I don't, I don't think I'll ever even attempt to do a colored portrait. As far as I'm concerned, Nico and Mike DeVries, those guys are the masters at it. There's, there's a few more people out there, but as far as I'm concerned, Nico and Mike DeVries, 
They're the first ones I've seen do the color portraits perfect. So I'm going to leave it up to them. There's no, there's no need for me to even jump into that right now. I'm going to stick to black and gray and leave the other stuff up to the masters. And believe me, those guys are the masters. In fact, if you Google Nico, N-I-K-K-O, or you Google Mike DeVries, D-E-V-R-I-E-S, those are some people to study as well. Look at their work online and check it out. It's some pretty crazy stuff. It almost makes me never want to do color tattoos again. The reason why I'm not talking about my techniques that I'm doing right now, as far as my shading, like I said, and I'll say it again, it's really important that you have the basics down. Really, really important that you have the basics of tattooing and pulling off gray. For example, if I was to do a scale from black to light gray, and that's all I was doing, I could pull that off, even if I didn't know how to do portraits. So should you. You should know how to get the perfect transitions. If you're doing a sacred heart, you're doing a skull, anything. Know how to do the perfect transitions before you attempt to do a portrait because all a portrait is is nothing but perfect transitions. Off camera, I did a little bit more of the black, but uh, before I finish this little area, I want to bring something up that's really, really important. A lot of times people do black, and what they do is they'll do this whole area the same tone maybe a little bit darker over here. They'll do this area the same tone, but when you're looking at your reference, you gotta realize that it's not all black. It's all tones. One way to always check yourself constantly to make sure you pull it off right is you relate your tones always. So this is a blacker line. This is probably a 100% black line. It kinda goes up to like a 90, 80, 70% black in this area. And then the table he's leaning on it's not black, but there's parts of it that are a 90% black. You just want to zoom in and zoom in again, like we talked about. Just zooming in, getting every single thing you see on, even the little nooks and crannies. Because, uh, I mean, there's sort of a tiny reflection in this table. And I'm just going to capture what I see. Not what I think I see, but what I see. And it's gonna, the end result's going to be that it looks just like the picture. In this table, there's darker shadows. And yeah, like I said, a lot of people just do one or two tones to pull what they think they see, and they're not really looking deep into the tattoo and the reference. So just always look super deep into it and just do what you see and break it down and break it down again. This whole portrait is a thousand different portraits. And right now, I'm doing a portrait of the table. So since I'm doing a portrait of the table, I'm gonna pretend that that's the only thing I'm doing today. I'm gonna lock myself out of everything else, and I'm just gonna do a portrait of the table. So remember, it's a portrait of a table, not a table. If it was a table, I could do it my way and how I want. But it's a portrait, so we're gonna do exactly like we see it and we're gonna spend time on it. We're not gonna just get it done like a lot of people would. Constantly looking at the reference, constantly comparing it to the other light sources. Sometimes you get locked in on an area and you're so locked in on it that by the time you're done, it's too late. You did it too dark or too light and I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. So you're constantly comparing the table to this black, the table to that black, the table to that tone. And it's real simple. You look at the picture and you say, is this darker or lighter than that? Okay, it's kind of like connect the dots. Once I've done this area, I've concentrated just on this area, this sets up how this is going to look. I look at the reference, I say this is about that tone. So I'm referencing from that tone. It's really important to set yourself up and cross-reference enough to make you have a headache when you're done. If you have a headache when you're done with the portrait, you're doing good. It's kind of like being on the computer for four hours. And every subtle detail of the black you want to capture, for example, it goes black, 90% black, 
and then sort of like a 30 to 40 percent gray back into a 50 to 60 percent gray here. A lot of people will just do black from there to there and a one tone of gray from there to there. Now what that makes it is a decent portrait or almost a portrait. And remember there's no such thing as an almost portrait. It's got to be exactly like the picture to be pulled off correctly. So you want to break it down. You know, I'm looking at the reference. I'm realizing that this area is darker right through there. So I'm just going to do what I see. It's really, really easy. Once you learn how to do the basic fundamentals, you do only what you see. This right here, this where the coat meets the glass, there's a, a darker a darker bend of reflection. I'm going to capture that. As the coat dips into where his tie would be, it's darker. Right where the end of the coat meets his face, it's almost pitch black, but just a small little line. What you have at the end of it all is a nice portrait. Remember, this is a portrait of just that area. I mean, literally, when I say zoom in, there's a little part on here where it's, it's a little bit sharper of a transition, and there's a little bit of another shadow right there, just so slightly. Never overdoing anything. You can always pull back and look at it. There's nothing wrong with pulling back. In fact, sometimes pulling back is what makes you not overdo a tattoo, a portrait tattoo anyways. Once again, just want to reiterate the fact that this might look easy, just like uh, the other day seeing Tony Hawk skateboard on TV, it looked kind of easy the way he was skateboarding, doing these crazy tricks, but ultimately if I try to do that, I'm going to fall on my ass because it's a trick. It just looks easy, and to him it is easy. To me, this, I wouldn't say easy. I could pull it off, and I know that I'll pull it off, and it, relatively it's easier than when I first tried to do a portrait, but Ultimately, it's not easy, and it might look easy just for the simple fact that it's going smoothly or trucking along, but there's a lot of techniques that you have to memorize to make it look easy and then for it to be easy. One of the techniques that you always have to remember, and I'll say it again, is you're constantly cross-referencing what you're doing. Like I said before, this is a thousand portraits all in one portrait, so we're constantly not locking ourselves into anything. As I'm locking myself into this part of the sleeve, I'm not really locked into it. It just looks like I am. I'm concentrating on it. But in the back of my mind, I'm referencing how this relates to this, how this meets the finger, how this meets the white under t-shirt. You're just constantly, your brain is constantly thinking when you're doing a portrait. You're constantly, and that's another reason why when you do a portrait, you know, everyone's got their own preferences that they like to, you know, do anything extracurricular while they're tattooing. That's on them. I'm not going to judge anybody, but one of my main beliefs is that you do a portrait sober. This stencil, like I said before, it's, it's still hanging in there with us. It's still making it possible to shade up against the lines which is really important when you're doing a technique like this where you're just using the shader to start out with you really need these stencils to stay and uh, you know it's, some people there's talk about a stencil as being a cheating technique well when it comes to the actual portrait tattoo you want your stencil to be perfect because your whole time I mean you literally have to be a genius if there's people out there that think they can pull a portrait off without uh, without using a stencil, I'd, I would sure love to get a copy of it and see it because actually I'd have to see the video to really believe it because when you're doing a portrait on skin, the skin bends. The skin, it, you know, it's not like a canvas, it bends, it, it's different. You want to definitely just lock in your stencil and follow those lines and believe me, there's no cheating when it comes to doing a portrait tattoo. That's why a very small percentage of people, tattoo artists, will ever be able to get it down. So there's no cheating at all when it comes to making a stencil. In fact, 
that's definitely one of the main parts of pulling, it, pulling this off correctly is getting that stencil perfect and leaving it on. Let's zoom in again. As this jacket sleeve folds into the other side, there's a little bit of a darker shadow as it meets. It's such a, it's such a subtle thing to even notice, but we want to get all the subtleties. That's what makes a portrait stand out, award-winning. That's what makes a portrait get you more portraits. Okay, as I'm coming in where the uh, back of his jacket meets the front of his hand, or actually his arm, coming in once again with the whole angle of the needle, going for a single needle slash three tight on this one. That's what it's equaling right now. Just working the angle, just working the tip. Okay, once again, we're going to talk about our setup. Um, I like to use the Pelican for the reasons I mentioned before, that they're just a lot more easy to, to work in the skin. seems like the ink, is, the ink is broken down thinner and finer, and uh, that's how it was put to me by uh, Jack, Rudy, and Bob Tyrell, which they kind of influenced me to use it too, and I definitely see the benefits of it. So I have my all-black ink as the first cup, and these two started out as just water, and I'm going to constantly keep changing them, but what I do is, this is of course my pure black, but when I want like a 90% gray, I'll dip it in the water with the machine running one time, really quick. That's changed it to about a 90 to 80% black, and then 70, 60, 50, 40. The more you dip it, and the more you bring it to the skin, is when it makes it to be the gradients that we need. I'd say after about 20 minutes of tattooing, this actually becomes a 50%. And when it becomes a 50% and I'm working an area on the face or the hands and I need a 30 or 20% black and gray, instead of dipping into here and then going into here until I get the 30, it's way easier for me to dip into this 50% black and then knock it down over here with the water, 40, 30, 20% black. And then I'll start tattooing. I now switch to the outliner machine. What we were talking about earlier about doing the details, like the fingers and the glass and even the face later on, we're going to start to pick away at it with the outliner machine. Uh, a lot of people talk about using a single needle, and I started my first three years in the tattoo world with a single needle, and that works good too. It uh, can take a little bit longer. Also, you got to realize that this, although it's an outliner, it's a 1205RL, which basically is a tight, tight outliner but I'm using it like a shader so that's why I'm going to be using this for the next probably 20-30 minutes or so on the glass just picking away at the detail and if you just want to watch the uh, way that I go about it is somewhat similar to how you would shade anything with even a mag but keep it in mind it's just a small small needle to just pick away at the detail The reason why I choose a 1205 over a uh, three tight or another small needle is that I find that sometimes when it's a smaller needle, it can kind of make the skin scar a little bit and heal bad the more times you go over it. When it's a bigger needle like a 1205, you uh, seem to have a little bit more uh, leeway with you know, the skin and how it heals. But this needle right here just literally lets you focus and zoom in on the smallest detail. Now, just to reiterate, uh, all these small details matter, especially when you have a portrait you're doing. You know, you want to show this piece to your friends and you want the people to be impressed, so you want to pick away super, ever so slightly using this technique with shading with the uh, smaller needles is something that I kind of 
been doing for the last three years, and it's kind of stepped up my portrait game pretty pretty heavily on the final product and how it looks. It's just uh, it makes a difference. Small details do make a difference. And uh, also, too, I want to point out if you're wondering why I'm not using the tip of the other machine, like I was talking about for quite a while, uh, sort of talking about how you can get a single needle from that one, and as to why now am I using this one, if that one uses a single needle. Uh, one, one important thing to think about is when you're going to be working in an area like this, which is consumed part of, the, part of a big part of the tattoo, you don't want to be having to use the sides of the machines for that long of a time. You want to get a you know a different machine, different needle to tackle the job. Whereas before when I was going into the corners with the sides of the shader, it's just a little bit here and then I'm back to my regular use of the shader a little bit here. Whereas this piece right here is practically done entirely with the uh, small needle. So we're going to stick to this for a little while. Also, too, uh, one of the main reasons why I like using the rotary is because it's so quiet. I mean, imagine shading the whole entire tattoo with the uh, sound of this in the background. It kind of gets annoying after a while, especially when you've been spoiled with the rotary for so long. But uh, I find the rotary to be a little bit too hard on the skin for outlining, so that's why I switched to this one for the shade or for the outlining. I use the regular outlining machine. Kind of makes it fun to switch back to the shader after doing this one because uh, this is a lot noisier. But when you're talking about this cognac glass that we're doing right here, we're talking about so much detail it has. It's got so much reflection on it. It's so minute that that's part of what's going to make this tattoo so nice is picking away at all this stuff until it gets done correctly. The key to doing a good portrait, one of the main keys is patience. All this stuff takes a while. you got to pick away at it. A lot of people are better than they are. They just don't know it because they haven't mastered patience yet. So if you could master patience, then you're naturally going to get better just from doing that. I think it's in everybody who just want to get it done, whatever your job is, whether you're an artist or working at a coffee, a coffee house or anything. You just want to just do things and get it done quickly, but tattooing is one of those things where there's no other option. If you want it to be done the right way, you have to take all the steps to get there. And all those steps add up to more time. And you just have to do it. Otherwise, you sacrifice quality. And we don't want that. Realistically, we could make this bottom part of the glass take only five minutes, but we're going to probably spend seven to eight, maybe even ten, just nailing it away. And then when we put the white in, it's going to just come to life. I can't wait for the white. That's my favorite part. It just kind of brings the whole tattoo to life in a really cool way. Even on something like this, I'm doing a portrait once again. I'm doing a portrait of the bottom of a glass. So I want this bottom of the glass to look exactly like the reference. Constantly looking away.
Even the shadows on his fingernail can't go unnoticed. All the portraits I've ever seen or anytime anyone's ever stopped me to ask me about their portraits or anything like that or ones that I've noticed in magazines, I look at the overall portrait and then I look at how it was achieved and accomplished and, it, and a lot of times you could tell the person was great at shading but they just didn't give it all they had. One of my biggest opinions is everybody's better than they think they are. Just like everything, it takes a while to, to do it right. It takes a while to get it done. And this part actually is fun. It's just fun working the area, making sure that it's perfect. It's like a challenge. It's a challenge to me to make this better than my last portrait. I'll point something out just to kind of know how serious that I am about the detail part of this portrait. Even something as detailed as that being all black, that being all black and there being like a minute piece of the skin showing. As it comes up to the shadow, it then starts to turn gray. Just, just that little minute little spot right there. You take that approach to the whole entire portrait, you're going to have a very, very, very nice portrait, very nice final product. After you're done, you're going to really be amazed. Just stick to these theories and stick to these, I call them tricks, because that's all a portrait is. It's just a bunch of tricks and theories and techniques combined into one that you've learned and you've mastered. Most, most importantly, I'll say it again, is patience. If you have someone else coming in, you're late on one of your appointments. Perfect example. Today, I have another appointment later on. And I don't care. I'm going to just pretend like I don't. If I have to reschedule, if I have to postpone, no matter what, a portrait is that important. You know, you can't really just stop it and come back to it. It's always better just to get it done in the same session, that way you don't lose your values, you don't lose anything. It's all fresh, you're in the mode. I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to stop this and come back to it a week later. It, it would be it wouldn't have the same energy, I think, you know, so no matter what, it's just really important to schedule enough time to finish a portrait, give yourself at least an hour of buffering. All these things make a difference. Everything I'm mentioning, it sounds like a small deal, and in it by itself, it is a small deal. But, you know, you have $101 bills, you have $100 now. Everything adds up. Everything adds up in the final product. As long as you keep to all these theories and own them, you'll amaze yourself. A lot of people don't think of shading with a, you know, a smaller needle like this, you know, whether it be a single needle or whether it be a 1205, which is what I'm using. And to be honest, it's definitely very tricky to shade with this. I mean, like I said, if you if you haven't tried this technique out, maybe uh, you know, I wouldn't rush into doing it on a portrait for the first time. Maybe you can try, you know, using it on a skull or something like that, a sacred heart, you know, just you know, your, your regular tattoos type of thing, different, different than a portrait. And uh, keep in mind, you know, 
part of the reason why it's hard to shade with an outliner needle is you don't want to overwork the skin and it's so easy to overwork the skin so easy when I first started tattooing for the first three to four years I did everything with a single needle so I think that's kind of where I had that embedded into my head you know if I did a big dragon or letters I was kind of forced to do it with a single needle because I didn't really know what else was out there at the time now I sure wish I did it would have saved me lots of time and energy I like to repeat myself for one reason. I just know that you know something as detailed as a portrait, you can't just tell somebody uh, something one time. So if I sound like I'm repeating myself, uh, anything I say twice or three times, just look at it like it's, uh, it's it's important to know. And what I'm about to say and repeat is the fact that everything else that I'm doing is I'm zoning out on. I'm right now doing a portrait of a cognac glass. That's all I see. That's all I'm focused on. To me, I'm going to pretend like that's all I have to do today, is a portrait of a cognac glass. I'm going to on purpose finish this whole entire glass with this needle just so you guys can see the importance of uh, picking away at the detail to really master it. A lot of cross hatching and stuff like this is always helpful. This entire uh, glass, I'm gonna do. I'm doing with like a 50 percent to kind of build it up. 50 percent ink, kind of gradient to fix it up to where it's gonna be so simple, just to add a darker tone than a lighter tone doing the whites. But uh, right now, just kind of doing it right, right in the middle, 50, and then slowly darkening it up. This makes it a lot easier. Sometimes people like to rush into the thing and any kind of tattoo they do they rush into it and just kind of finish it going back and forth when it got to me it gets confusing it's better just to kind of lay out 
your overall with a certain tone, you know, mainly a lighter tone or a 50% tone, you know, and then start darkening areas up like this or like that or these areas or these areas. But I like to lay this tone down overall for the first part of any type of portrait piece. Even little reflections, something's really close. Whenever you're doing glass or a cup or anything like that, definitely want to pay attention to how the reflection in the glass plays along with the surrounding areas, like the finger. It just kind of helps you in the, the confusing state of mind that any portrait will put you in. You know, you just want to make it easier on yourself. So just constantly be aware of what's reflecting and how it plays a part in the, in the glass for the texture. Now I'm going to go back with the 70% uh, ink and kind of just lay it into my 50% ink just to kind of make it more of a 3D object now versus 2D. Like I was talking about earlier, just laying out your overall 50% tones, 40% tones, then you go into it and darken it up. It makes it come back more to life. And uh, it's easy to follow this technique, less confusion. So I'm thinking I'm done with the glass. I'm just going to kind of like stop and pause for a second and just kind of check myself here. I like, to, I like to say that word, check yourself, because it's part of what tattooing is all about, especially a portrait. You've got to constantly make sure that you're doing the best job you can, that you're following the, uh, the orders. I look at it like this portrait is like a dictator. It's telling you what to do, telling you how to do it, and you have to listen to him and listen carefully and follow his instructions, you know? So, when you do that, you see little things like I see here, like I, I gotta darken this up a little bit to make it exact. Let me see what else pops out. Maybe a little bit darker over here. A little darker over here. There's some texture in the glass, kind of like just miscellaneous reflections. Now it's really starting to come to life. When I put the white in here, it's really going to look nice. Okay. As far as my outliner machine goes and how I switched and the reason why I switched, I think I'm ready to go back to my shader now. Okay, I switched back to the shader machine. Now that I've kind of got all my my roadmaps laid out for my tight tight detail, which is why we switched to the other machine and the other needle. So now I got my shader back. I'm just going to kind of do a little bit of follow up cleanup, you know, just making sure I got these overall tones. And this is stuff right now that you really wouldn't want to do with the outliner.
And yeah, once again, just, you know, tightening, tightening up the fingers and getting that nice overall tone, the overall skin tone and shade. That's the fun thing about switching back and forth. It just uh, kind of gives you a break into the next machine and just kind of gives you more of a chance to, uh, to nail it down. Nailing it down is the key. Areas like this where the finger has kind of uh, got a lot of wrinkles and things on it and there's just a lot of texture, it's good to revert back to the uh, darker stencil that we made earlier. It gives you more of a road map to go off of for the, uh, the dark, the darker shades and more the texture. Now something like this, when I'm back in my uh, groove with the shader machine and I'm utilizing that technique where I got the single needle out, it's definitely a perfect example of the right time when to utilize that single needle three tight technique with your shader. You know, kind of for example, we're going into just that finger and right there and a little bit right there, maybe a little more, maybe even a little more. Okay, one more important technique to uh, think about is when you squint your eyes, sometimes you got to go back and forth and squint your eyes and you'll see that this white collar and how it looks on the reference, you got to keep it that way. A lot of times when people do white, they have a tendency to over scrub it and it turns gray and it's not really gray. Sometimes you have to let the skin breathe. You have to let, I call it letting the artwork breathe. And in this case, there's just a little bit of shading on the bottom part of the sleeve. Then we get a really wash. This is really, really watered down. This is about a 10% ink right here. I'll just kind of transition that shade into the uh, rest of the sleeve and then I'll stop. You know, and it's done. You know, I don't want to overkill it. It's really, really, that's how it looks actually. A little bit right there. That's how it looks in the picture and it makes for good contrast. Now we're moving on to this skull base thingamajigger. I don't know what it is, but it's a skull base. And uh, we're just going to go ahead and do what we see. That's another great part of doing portraits. You don't have to know what it is. You just do what you see. We're going with about a 90% ink right now. We're just kind of building it up. Building up this bottom shadow. This shadow kind of, it's really important to see and notice how shadows meet other shadows. This base is a shadow and how it meets the shadow of his jacket. You want to be mindful of how it does so and make sure that it's exactly how it is. Part of that is just once again relating your tones, comparing. Now we're getting some detail. This, this, uh, you know, like we said, I don't know what I'm doing right now as far as this actual marking that's on the base, but I'm just doing exactly what I see and it's kind of a practice or it's kind of a refresher to let you know that you're not in control creatively of this portrait or any portrait your, your, your job is to do what you see and that's it 
There's a famous technique where you hold your painting upside down and you, and you do the portrait upside down. And what that does is it kind of tells your mind that uh, you know, you're only going to paint what you see. So when you turn it upside down, it forces your brain to kind of make it not really a portrait at that point. It's just about painting shapes because ultimately that's all this is, is a bunch of shapes and shades. And sometimes, sometimes your mind can actually mess it up by trying to dictate to you what, how it should look or what it, what it could have to make it better, but we don't want that. Not when we're doing portraits. There's really not much to this base other than the fact that it's an object and it's, you know, falls in line with a portrait, you know. Uh, there's not much really to talk about on this base other than just pay attention to the reference and just do what you see, as well as uh, these reflections probably are the one thing that we can talk about. The reflections on this kind of represent the texture. You could almost tell that this is sort of a either a shiny wood or a shiny actually I'm gonna go with wood. This this to me seems like it's a shiny wood base from the reflection and how it looks so kind of important to pick up on that type of thing. It makes it easier to approach. One thing to always remember and everybody should already know this but if not it's always good just to say it you know, when you're referencing for, to do a portrait and you're doing a portrait from reference, you want to make sure that if it did come from a colored source, if someone hands you a colored picture of your, uh, your tattoo that you're going to do, you just want to double check and make sure you've changed it to black and gray for the reference. So, once again, if, if you're doing a black and gray portrait and you have a colored reference, go to Kinko's, make sure you do a black and gray uh, copy of it on photo mode. That way you're uh, getting your exact tones that the, that the color portrait doesn't have. I definitely wouldn't advise a normal copy machine. It's always good to do the photo mode at uh, Kinko's or a place like that that has access to those types of copy machines. This base right here, it's kind of fun to uh, take advantage of the whole outlining that it has with the uh, shader. We're going to kind of fade that out. So we're just going to kind of leave it light on purpose. I love these reflections. I don't know if you just noticed why and how I was moving my machine around. Sometimes you want to make sure you feel comfortable, you know what I mean? Before you approach it, you want to switch it around until you feel it. And then go for it. Remember, all, all, all this is is a bunch of shapes, you know, just different shapes, 
different textures. On this particular portrait, the re one of the reasons why I chose to do this portrait is it's got so much to learn from. It's got so much. You got glass, you got wood, you got different shapes, you have texture, you have hands, you have buttons, wrinkles. I mean, this portrait has it all to learn from. You can pretty much apply all this knowledge that you'll learn today to any tattoo, you know. Your, your next Sacred Heart or your next skull or anything should automatically be better if you apply these techniques. Jumping back really quick to the outliner for two reasons. Uh, remember one thing, you're always going to see things you forgot or, or passed up throughout the whole entire tattoo. I'm just kind of adding what I didn't get the first time and it's up to you to not be lazy and pass these things up. They're like opportunities to make your tattoo better I call them. So once you notice it, don't be lazy and say ah oh well. Once you notice it, it's up to you. You got to get your liner and do some more work. Right now, we're going to outline the skull. Skulls are something I love to freehand and add my own spin on, so I'm going to kind of take this opportunity to kind of add my own spin on the skull itself, but nothing else. Just to make it a little bit more fun. This is getting back into, uh, I mean, we could touch on a couple of little techniques that don't have to do with portraits, just because we're going to go ahead and we're doing a skull, it's part of a portrait piece. And since I'm kind of adding my own flair onto it, it's going to be just a fun, kind of like a fun break. It's almost like a little break getting away from being so stressed as far as having to pull this off correctly because... Let's face it, portrait tattoos are uh, stressful. Anyone who's ever tried it or done it before, it's just a very stressful tattoo to pull it off. And we're talking somebody, somebody's skin. You know, you have a, you're not just trying something on paper. You're trying it on somebody who's going to comment on it. I like to do a lot of texture on my skulls. It just uh, makes it a lot, lot, lot more funner to look at when there's a lot going on. You know, I want to make the skull super detailed. Once again, you know, like I said earlier, you're going to always find things that you can do a little bit better. Sometimes when you focus on something, it's impossible for you to see it all. It's almost like you got to come back to it. So over here, I'm just kind of making the shadow not so tight. Just 
switch back to my uh, trusty shader. There we go. This right here, we're just kind of building up that medium tone like we were talking about earlier. Get a medium tone on there and then you get to go in there with the darks and bring it out. Sometimes it's the easiest little techniques that make the difference. The reflections, the water droplets, things like that is what makes tattoos a lot more impressive. A lot of these techniques, though, once again, you can apply to anything. Glass, wood, the fun part about tattooing when you get into textures. All right, now for the fun part, skull. Skulls are always fun. I don't know why, but they are. Something fun about this particular piece is the fact that usually the portraits I do is a face or it's of an object or a person. Whereas this one, it's got, you know, a face, but it's got two objects. It's got the glass and it's got the skull. It's kind of a, not really in your everyday portrait. So I'm kind of taking advantage of it and making it a little bit more of a custom piece. And I can get really heavy into the texture, which is kind of one of the reasons why I chose to uh, add a little bit of my style into it, just because the picture didn't really have enough texture. And I'm going to really, really go off on the texture and make it interesting with cracks and pits and stuff like that. One thing about the texture is you kind of do the overall tone with the shader and you kind of go back with your outliner and add a bunch more detail. It always helps when you have somebody that doesn't complain about the pain. This man is doing pretty good. No complaints. I haven't heard anybody say ouch yet. Yeah, this is definitely a little break. This is kind of like a mental break right now. I'm just kind of getting to pull away from the whole detailed portrait and kind of having fun being loose with the skull.
What's going to really make this skull pop is when I add the white. It's going to really pop out. A fun technique I might share with somebody that might not know is sometimes you go over the whole tattoo. Part of making the tattoo look super realistic is how every part of the skin is touched with some kind of gray. So sometimes grazing over the whole thing makes it in the end look super soft and really portrait style. I'll switch to the outliner. This is like a 100% uh, black right here. Just kind of going in there, getting the detail in. cracks and whatnot. Little pits like this, this is stuff that's funner to do with the outliner machine. Lots of texture.
Okay, we are back to the shading. We're gonna knock out the rest of his coat, and then we're gonna work our way up to his hands, and then his face. Last part for the black and gray before we do the white. This is the best part of having a good stencil. This stencil is really telling me a lot of information. Another aspect to think about when you're doing a portrait is, you know, you don't really want to do it just for the money. You don't really want to get into portraits just for the money because I don't think you'll ever grasp the right way to do a portrait if that's your motivation. Although, if you ever do get to the point which is very possible to master portraits, you uh, should definitely be charging a good amount of money for the portraits. They're really hard to do. It's more of a specialty field and uh, a lot of the guys that do portraits and do it well charge up to a thousand dollars or more to do them right. So you're giving these people something that's virtually priceless. If you can if you can pull off a portrait like you're supposed to, you're giving them something that's more than a tattoo. It's more of a gift at that point. Just working that shadow again, making sure that it falls exactly how it should. Shadows are definitely interesting because they're actually not that easy. Shadows within shadows anyways. So those are the hard ones when you do a shadow within a shadow. Just working that shadow again, making sure that it uh, falls exactly how it should. Shadows are definitely interesting because it's actually not that easy to do it right. Just knocking out the coat a little bit. It's just, uh, it's always fun doing drapery and stuff like that. This kind of falls in the drapery category. Really, really important when you're doing a portrait of drapery and not just kind of freestyle it to make sure the same rules apply to the, uh, to this, uh, jacket as if you were doing a face. You'll, you'll, you'll basically look at the, the reference and see that even though he probably has a black coat on, just the way the picture's taken, it's going to be 3D looking, so therefore it'll sort of look gray. Once again, utilizing the uh, tips of the needle and making sure that, you know, you're getting all the use you can out of 
every curve and bend of the needle wherever you need it to be. I'm having fun with this portrait. It's just got a lot of fun elements to it. Another helpful technique when you're doing the overall shading, meaning you know you got this huge area of gradient, and you definitely got to pull it off to where you can't see any, you don't want to see any lines or any like uh, needle markings or whatnot. You know you want the goal of every portrait artist is to make it as smooth as possible. One of the ways I do that is uh, what I do, what I like to do is kind of graze over the whole thing with a really light gray. It kind of opens up the skin a little bit. makes it easier to start laying in your darker and darker and even darker tones. Just kind of open up the skin. Just kind of switching it up every time you go over it, you know. You go that, you go over it that way. Now you're going over it this way. The best type of skin I like to work on is probably just nice white tight skin, you know what I mean? It's just easy to maneuver, easy to manipulate. And it just looks the best. It looks the best because it's so white that every Every gradient of gray, every part of the gray gradient is going to show. The darker the skin is, the less you could uh, really get into the light gray. So you got to rely on your darks. You have to rely on your dark tones to really pull out the portrait. You kind of have to uh, approach it a little bit different. So the lighter the skin is, the easier it is to work a portrait. Now that we've kind of opened up the skin, we start introducing a little bit darker tone. Starting to pull this together and make it look like a really true coat, a darker coat. You know, a lot of times you don't want to do it too light, otherwise it's not going to look correct. But he does have a dark dark gray coat, possibly black it looks like. I always want to keep that in the back of your mind, how it's supposed to look. So that you don't go too dark.
starting to come together here. Going over these buttons just to give them kind of a tone too. Hopping back to the uh, fine line shading needle, we're going to knock out these buttons. These buttons are pretty much uh, smaller portraits. I'm doing a bunch of, I'm doing four portraits of buttons. Luckily, it's not that much uh, to it, according to the reference. Um, a lot of times when you stare at a portrait and you're doing a portrait and you see buttons or a necklace, it's just a couple a couple uh, strokes of the needle to make it look like uh, the picture.
So just going over the whole entire piece like this, the whole, it's a large area to shade. It's really hard to get a consistent shade. Hard to get a consistent shade on a, on a big area. I mean, this area is not too big, but it's still a pretty, pretty big area to get a, an even fade. And the way, the way we do that is just build it up little by little from light to dark. If you go dark to light, it's a lot harder. Light to dark makes it easy, makes it transitional. One of the best ways to learn how to do portraits, it's kind of a trick. What it is, is you go get yourself a portrait by someone who knows how to do them. And you just really, really study it and watch. Hopefully it's an area where you can see. And there's nothing like feeling the portrait and seeing it done. That's how I got my first portrait uh, done by Jack Rudy. I was able to watch, it was on my legs, so I was able to watch and I think that uh, just that one session kind of stepped up my game really huge amount I was able to watch and relate and I could tell how deep he was going because I could feel it We are coming to an end on the jacket here, making our way up to the, uh, the the favorite spot, the face, even the hands. Oh yeah, we're getting close. The collar of the uh, shirt, same thing with the other collar, just making sure that you don't do it too white or too dark. Actually, leave it white. Let it breathe. And my reference, all I have is just a little bit of, little bit of shading right there in the tip. That's about it. Really, nothing else.
Yeah. A scrub, like a really light scrub. Alrighty, it's gonna heal real nice, real nice. I'm gonna kind of dip into here, get the hand finished. We're using that technique where we're uh, using the uh, tip of the needle. This is why it's so important to have such a good reference because if you notice how this stencil is not falling off at all. I kind of learned this technique from watching Nico tattoo. He's one of the great portrait artists that does color portraits. But uh, that's kind of how I first learned about stencil stuff. And uh, just watching him tattoo at the conventions, I just noticed how the stencil would not come off at all. And that was so important because I've had so many times where I lost a stencil and it was just made my job a lot harder. But uh, yeah, I'm very glad that you shared that with me. I'm gonna go ahead and change to my outliner and just knock out some really tight detail. Once again, this needle just allows you to get really deep into the nooks and crannies of the tattoo. And really, there's only two reasons why somebody wouldn't do this. Because, uh, you know, they're just lazy-minded, like I uh, used to be when I first started. Or, they don't know. So, now that you know, you got no choice but to do this every time. And this goes for every tattoo. You know, you just want to make sure you get in there, whether it's with the outliner or whether it's with the shader, uh, you just want to go in there and just get the detail. Okay, we're going to kind of do a line right now that separates the 
pan from the face. It's very light gray, so we're going to do it in light gray. The intensity of the black that I'm using right now, especially for that line we just did, right over here, it's about a 50%. Just enough to kind of lay down the uh, road map. And then uh, we're going to switch back to the uh, shader. Okay, we have finally landed ourselves on the face. I'm gonna just start with the ear and then switch needles. And we're about to get on down to the face. Now this is a semi-small face to even be working with right here for a portrait, so we're going to actually approach it really delicate. You just want to build up the face little by little, starting with your lights, to your darkers, to your blacks, and just little by little build it up. Okay, we'll start with the lips. Keeping in mind you're just following that same thing I said over and over again. Uh, the lips are the only thing that matters to me at the moment right now. I want to kind of approach the face the same way uh, we approach the uh, the cognac glass. It's really subtle. Doing most of our shades with the actual uh, outliner just to get it nailed. I mean, this face is kind of small. It's packed with lines, wrinkles, all kinds of detail, which make it for a good portrait but also a stressful one if you uh, don't follow the rules. Me in general, I like to do my face last because it's where I need the most concentration. And, you know, there's other people that will do it the other way. There's no wrong or right way to, to do what I'm about to, about to say. It's just that for me, I like to worry about the most detailed spot last when everything else is done. So right now as I'm doing the face, my worries aren't, oh, I gotta do this whole entire thing. It's more like this is it. It's the last stretch. And it kind of takes a little bit of pressure off of me. And my thing is, is if you're uh, doing a portrait, you want the least amount of pressure possible. So basically I'm taking the pressure off of me now. I'm just literally gonna just concentrate on every nook and cranny. Now earlier when I talked about looking back and forth at your reference, 
It doesn't get more detailed than the face. When, you, when, you, when you're doing a face, that's when you really have to use those rules. They have to really, really apply. And this is a 50% right here. Now when I do portraits, what I like to do, and like I said, my way isn't the only way. There's a bunch of ways to do it, but my way is what I like to do. And what that way is, is uh, I like to complete the mouth, the nose structure, the eyes, and then get my, I like to do all those things with my liner. And then I like to move on to the shader and then do the bigger areas of detail, like the, like the broad cheekbones and all that type of stuff. But uh, really important for me, just to use this machine and get all the detail possible that I can. For everyone who's ever trying to do a portrait and trying to get better at it, um, you got to realize you're always going to be learning how to do better. I mean, I got tattooed by Bob Tyrell recently and I learned a lot on portraits, you know. Um, so you're always going to learn. It just comes to the point where it's kind of like, uh, you know, you take the hottest chick you can imagine. If you really break her down, she's going to have a couple flaws here and there, but overall she's going to be really hot. That's what I like to consider my portraits to be. I'm always going to break them down and I'm always going to want to do things better, you know, just like anything. Um, but you want to overall make it really hot, you know what I mean? You want to make it super, super fun to look at and you want to cover all your bases so that if anyone is to really look close at your portraits, the only things you need to fix and get better at are the things that will only make you a 10 on a scale of 1 to 10 versus a 9, 9.5. Always understand there's room for growth and uh, I'll never know it all. This portrait right here is probably falls into the category of difficult and what I mean by that, uh, I'll break it down, it's difficult because it's time consuming. It's got so many different elements that you know it's just a time consuming piece. It's got hands, glass, skeleton, face, jacket, you know, fingers, button so it's really detailed it's really uh, a, a, a tough portrait to do but at the same time it's just a great portrait to learn from really really great portrait to learn from but yeah so overall this is a is you know a semi difficult portrait i mean they're all hard um price wise a portrait like this you know could run you you know a thousand dollars you know easy maybe fifteen hundred depending on how big you're doing it that's why it's really important uh, to really master these portraits so you can get people knocking on your door wanting to pay you the money you deserve. The eyes are like the rims in a car. You, you have them, uh, you nail the eyes and you're going to nail a really good portrait. It's just one of those things where the eyes are so important, it, it gives it life. Portraits in general, like I said, is, are, are they're very important tattoos, and you know they're, they're meaningful tattoos, especially when you get a family member. Um, you know, people that generally come to me for a portrait, they want uh, you know a family member, like a kid or a deceased loved one. 
that seems to be one of the most popular ones I've been tattooing in my portrait career is just uh, loved ones. And, you know, I, I have a portrait of my son and my mother on me, so I can, I can relate to that feeling and uh, wanting a portrait. And uh, there's nothing like having a portrait on you. It's, it's, it's almost not like a tattoo. It's almost like something else. It's almost uh, a different fulfillment. Not to mention, you know, having a good portrait on you, you'll have an old lady stop you at a grocery store that never liked tattoos before, but you'll just kind of change her mind about the whole tattoo just uh, just from having a portrait because it's just so it's just so uh, interesting to see a really nice portrait being done. It just looks nice. Every now and then I get lucky and I get I get to tattoo a celebrity or a musician um, like Fieldy, uh, who's turned out to be a pretty nice guy and friend and lives close to our shop. Uh, but he's let me he's allowed me to do some of my favorite portraits on him, some Bernini portraits and uh, Jesus portrait and the Mother Mary portrait. Those portraits are always fun. It's always a challenge to uh, make sure you leave those guys happy because you know they're always getting asked to you know to get to ta to get tattooed by everybody. So it's always fun to put a portrait on someone like that because then they uh, they really like it and it's it's kind of fulfilling in a way. Every artist I think naturally is uh, it's kind of like low self-esteem against their own artwork. You know, most of the artists I know it's we always think we're not as good as we are. We always want to try harder, and that's good. That's a good attitude to have because it'll keep you humble. You know what I mean? I mean, with my own work, I'm always trying to uh, get better. I'm, I'm always criticizing my own work, and uh, I think it's important to always have that attitude because it'll keep you, it'll keep you striving to be better. And uh, striving to be better is what makes you the best. So you know, tattooing guys like Fieldy, it's almost like it's your time to shine. You know, you have to leave them with a piece that they're gonna pay attention to and like you know and as I said before as an artist you know we, we, we tend to kind of look down on our own work no matter how good it is so you know when you do a celebrity like that or somebody like that who's had a lot or anybody for that matter who has a lot of tattoos you know that you know that they know what's good and what's not good so tattooing those guys it's like it's no joke you definitely got to be on your A game you definitely got to give them something that they're going to like. And your goal is to try to make them, you know, love their new piece and be infatuated with the new piece because, you know, guys like that, tattoos aren't really impressing. They don't really impress them as much as uh, a person who's just getting their first or second tattoo. You know, they, they're, they're covered heavily from toe to toe. So it's just always a challenge. Okay, switching back into the shader, I've kind of worked uh, the tight areas uh, enough to where uh, I'm ready for the shader to start knocking out some of these bigger detailed areas like the face, hair, and forehead and things like that.
If you're doing a big portrait, you want to make sure the guy has a good pain threshold and pain tolerance because when you're sitting for four or five, six hours, you know, you don't want to get into a situation where they, they want to stop, you know. My portrait from Bob Tyrell took uh, seven hours and uh, it hurt like hell, but I couldn't stop, had to get done. So you just want to make sure that they have a, a good pain tolerance, you know. Especially if you know it's going to take more than three, four hours. On that note of just making sure they can sit, you know, portraits, you know, they're always better to get done in one session as far as the first pass, you know. There's some portrait artists that like to do a couple passes, you know, and, and uh, if that's your style, that's, that's cool too, but it's always good just to get the first, get at least a pass done the first time around so that when it heals, everything's even, you know. The way I do my portraits is, uh, they're pretty much done when he, you know, when he leaves here today, he'll have a finished portrait, but what we're going to actually cover also a little bit later on is the proper way to touch up a portrait. Uh, one of the, one of the most important parts of a portrait, something I've been leaving for last, is, uh, as a tattoo artist, you guys know that every tattoo, especially black and gray, tends to fade a, li a little bit here and there. And if you're doing a, a lion or tribal or a, a sacred heart or an object type of tattoo, if something fades a little bit, usually nobody's going to be able to tell. But on a portrait, you can't really afford to have the eyes fade or the nose fade or the lips. Things like that, people will kind of know, you know what I mean? Especially a pupil. Sometimes people don't put black and you know deep enough in the pupil. It tends to fade, so when we're talking about touch-ups, which we'll jump into in, later on in the DVD, we have to actually realize it. A lot of tattoo artists won't touch up a portrait for whatever reasons, and I, uh, I personally think that every portrait it benefits the artist as well as the customer to do a brief touch-up. You know, maybe graze over the face a little bit more, darken up the nose. You know. There's been certain times, uh, like I said, my tattoo that I got from Bob, for some reason, you know, that that was one of the first tattoos I've ever seen heal perfectly, you know, and occasionally you'll get that. And like I tell all my customers, come back in two weeks, let me see how it heals, and I tell them most likely we'll do a touch-up session, which is another reason why the portraits are expensive, you know. You charge $750 to $1,000 a portrait, what they have to understand is a lot of times that that entails touching it up once again, you know. I'll spend another hour on this portrait three weeks from now. But yeah, overall, I really think it's important to touch up portraits. I don't see any reason why an artist wouldn't touch up a portrait unless, they, uh, unless they're like Bob and they can just nail it the first time, you know. And that has a lot to do with, of course, technique. But then a lot of times, you know, sometimes people's skin just won't take the tattoo as well as others. So, like I say, it's, it's always beneficial to, to uh, tell your customer that your portraits are going to include a touch-up session, which also justifies the price once again. You know, you're charging a lot for a portrait. You let them know that you're going to have to touch it up again. It's almost like a second session. You know, a lot of times it's the customer's fault that they went swimming or whatnot. And if you have any proof of that, you make them pay a little bit more. But uh, overall, your reputation's on the line. So why wouldn't you want somebody out there walking around with a perfect tattoo that you did to get you more customers? You gotta look at the long run. If, uh, if your tattoo's fading, which is a number one problem with portrait artists, if your tattoo's out there and it's fading and somebody happens to look at it, you'll never know what they're thinking in their head. You'll never know that they didn't want to come to you because it was faded and they don't want a faded tattoo. On the other note is if that same person sees your tattoo and you happen to touch it up and it looks perfect, now you have another customer. So you just want to always act like whoever's sporting your pieces is going to potentially get you more customers and build up your, rep your reputation around town in the tattoo industry. Guys like Bob Tyrell and Jack Rudy and Nico and Mike DeVries, all these portrait artists, they work hard to get the reputation that they have. You know, it, it takes uh, 10 to 20 years to uh, make an overnight success, as I heard put it best one time. So these, these guys are popping up on the scene with these portraits and stuff. A lot of hard work goes in making this happen. All it takes is a little bit more time and a little bit more patience to secure your reputation in the industry as being one of the best.
you know, as I'm tattooing this portrait, I'm going to go ahead and set myself up for the white. You know, as, I, as I'm approaching the nose and as I'm approaching, you know, lots of these areas where I know I'm going to put white in, I'm setting myself up, you know. What I mean by that in more detail is, being that white's pretty much an opaque color, if it's used properly, and we're going to talk about how to use white properly, properly meaning you want it to last. Uh, you know, you want to you want to set yourself up by having background, darker background, where you know there's going to be whites, just so you could make it pop more. Well, we're going to town on this face over here. Trying to just not miss out on any detail. Getting every wrinkle in there, you see. One of the best parts about touching up your portrait is no matter what, you could always, always add more to it when you when you have him come back, you know. For example, I'm already knowing that when he comes back, I'm gonna add more, I'm gonna add more wrinkles, I'm gonna define the wrinkles even more, and uh, this portrait's gonna look its best after the second session. Chewy from Tattoo Land, excellent portrait artist. He follows this technique very well, and a lot of times I see him going over his pieces which he's done a piece on me, he's done a portrait on me, and uh, he'll hit it again. And I, I always respect the fact that he's got his reputation on the line and he, and he knows that he wants to be known as one of the best tattoo artists doing portraits, so he, he always makes sure to go the extra mile on you. Mainly these things are all about habit. Everything I'm talking about is a habit. I tell people I've been tattooing for so long, I've kind of at times lost the whole mood thing. I don't really tattoo from a mood point of view. I'm rarely in a mood to tattoo, just from life and running a shop and all that stressful stuff. So you really gotta learn to tattoo from the mode. You gotta learn to snap into tattoo mode. You know, if you're not, if you're not feeling like doing a portrait, you gotta learn how to just get into the mode. Try not to rely on the feeling, because that's what uh, will separate you from being a great tattoo artist. Or I should say great portrait artist. Another technique really quick on foreheads, especially ones with texture and wrinkles, is it's always good to shade the forehead in the direction of the wrinkles. When it heals, it just seems to flow better. It's good to do that with a wash of about a 30% black, and then maybe follow it with a 40 to 50%. We're getting really close to the white. 
Now I'm going back to the outline. I just call this the cleanup. This is something I got taught by Jack Rudy when he was tattooing my leg. I never used to do this before. When I was done shading the face, I was done, so I thought. It's always good to go back into it. It's just your eye sees things differently the second and third time around, just like anything. to really concentrate on the wrinkles this way as well. And you get to go back in the uh, hair, one of the most important and most neglected areas of a tattoo portrait. A lot of people do the, the portrait so good, and then they'll leave the hair, or they'll just rush the hair. Well, you can't do that. You gotta pay attention to the hair just like anything else. I think, me personally, hair is one of the main things I'm fascinated with. I think a lot of people look at that stuff. They look at all the details, so it's just real important to go in there and capture it all. Luckily, in, in my case, I don't have too much hair on him. So it's pretty, pretty basic on, on Alfred Hitchcock here. I get to even go in and uh, do more detail on the fingers. So you get to go in there and just add more detail. And there's nothing wrong with adding a lot of detail. You only want to add what you see, so. When you're taking your time adding, adding, adding detail, just make sure it's there. Make sure you're not falling into free, uh, freestyle mode, I call it. You know, when you're doing a portrait, you want to be very careful to not to fall into that freestyle mode where you just catch yourself doing it your way. We're coming to my favorite, favorite, favorite part of portraits, the white. It's not a long session of white, but I'll tell you what, white's one of those things where you want to make sure you do it right. Getting all that black out is very important. One of the main things I like about plastic tubes is it doesn't lodge in there as much as uh, the other metal tubes do. There's a lot of uh, fallacies out there about white, and I'm here to correct the ones I know to be true. The first one is you have to use white properly for it to look properly and last properly. And there's three things you gotta know off the bat. First thing is you gotta clean out your tube to make sure it doesn't turn brown or black. Second thing is you gotta turn up the power high enough to where it gets deep enough to where it lasts as long. And third of all, you gotta hit it and move on. You can't stay in a particular area for too long or otherwise you sacrifice scarring then losing the ink. I'm going to hit this button right here. One of the main mistakes I've seen a lot of people do is they'll use white in a tattoo, but they won't water it down when it comes to fading the white. White's just like any other tone, so, you know, sometimes I see these portraits done, there's perfect transitions everywhere with the black and gray, and then and they, go, they go ahead and mess it up. 
by putting white in and it's just too sharp looking it doesn't look feathered this glass has a reflection right here a lot of artists will just do that they'll put white in but what they don't do is you gotta dip it in water just like you do in black and gray and you gotta fade it out you gotta vignette it out just like a black and gray tattoo very important to know that There's a reason why I did that. It's really simple. That's how it looked on the picture. So you got to keep that in mind. If you're doing what you see, people are doing these portraits sometimes and they just put the white in there really, really sharp. But that's not how it looks. Making make sure that it's deep, deep enough. And keep in mind you want to shade the white in. How I'm doing it right now, I'm shading it in. I'm shading it in. Turn the power up a little bit. White definitely hurts a little bit more. And keep in mind when you're doing white, you got to be sensitive to the fact that you know, one of the main reasons why it doesn't stay too is because they overwork the white in an area that's already been worked to the point where it's almost overworked with the black and gray. So when you get in with white, you got to get in and get out. So you're putting your white in really deep and you're going and getting water and you're fading it out. Very important. Because this way your white's gonna last. You know, I call this proper use of white. I'm gonna give you another example of the wrong way to do white and then how to do it the right way. A lot of people will take this area and they'll go and they'll put the white in with one stroke and that's done to them. Now, keep in mind, like I said before, it just doesn't look right. You gotta, you gotta fade it in. Grab some water, it's the best way to do it. Treat it just like a black and gray piece. It works with the same principles. White is the best tool in a portrait. You use it the right way, you're going to trip people out. Let's hit this bottom. This is really going to pop. It's, it almost doesn't even look like a cup until I put the white in there, or a glass cup, I should say. Now you see how it's starting to come to life with the white. Keep in mind, I'm going pretty deep. I'm making sure that it's in there. You know, people say, oh, white doesn't last. Well, how, how, what do they mean? Black doesn't last, I can tell them. When you put pitch black in there, how come when it heals, it's not as pitch black as when you first put it on. What it is, it's, it's still a dark tone, but white, what it does is, if it's used properly, it's not gonna exactly stay 100% white, but what it will do is it'll stay 80% white, and that's enough to get the results you're looking for. White can last years if it's used properly. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and uh, go back to the face. Do my white on the face. I kinda go in there with a watered down white. You want to just be careful not to make them look like they're sweating, you know? So you want to just go in there really subtle, keeping in mind you gotta, you got to remember how it's going to heal.
There's a lot of good whites out there. I like to use Star Bright White. Eternal's another good white. There's other ones out there that I just haven't had the luxury of trying them. But uh, Eternal and Star Bright are the ones that I've tried and I like them a lot. They're really opaque, which is important. I'm gonna switch really quick to my shader to get some big amounts of white in. Let's go ahead and grab this coupling right here. And then we go in with the water, just to wash it. Remember, we want gradients with white. White's such an important color to not screw up. One of the easiest things I can tell anybody is just to water the white down. What I mean by water is not putting water in the white, but you dip it in the white. You place it in the skin where you need to, you work it. Right when you need to blend the white into the skin, you come back and you dip it in the water a couple times. And then you bring it back with the watered down white and kind of graze it together, making it look more realistic. We're going to get right in there with the white. This is pure white, no water yet. We're kind of scooting it out. I'm going to dip back in the water, and we're going to go ahead and just like it was black and gray, we're going to wash it into the roundabout of the sleeve. And I'll tell you what, this will last forever, meaning it'll always transition well. It'll all, you'll always notice a lighter color. And like I tell people that, that tell me that white's not going to last, I tell them, of course they're right. White's not going to stay white, 100% white. But what it's going to do is it's going to always be seen. You'll always notice the white. Now we're on the reflective areas of... I'm going ahead and choosing to use the end of the needle. I don't know anybody who could tell me that, that that doesn't look better than if I didn't use white. White takes a little bit longer, but it's worth it in the end, especially when you got your reputation on the line and you want to make sure that you're uh, one of the best in the business. We're pretty much getting to the closing parts of the white. We're going to go ahead and get the skull. I'm choosing to come in with some, a, a, a texture-like technique. I'm laying out my textures. Then I'm going to dip into the water and come back over it and kind of soften out those textures. Now before I go on with any more white, this is what's needed for the skeleton. Now you're putting this white in. It's looking like it needs to be washed, wouldn't you say? Now we're going over it with watered down white. We're just gonna wash it into the tattoo so it doesn't look so doesn't look so scary and so thick and so heavy. We want to let the white We want to let the white breathe a little bit. Another good thing to do is kind of get with water down white and you, know, you kind of follow the crack.
A little bit of reflection in the teeth. Little flashes of white in the background always help out a little bit, you know, make it make it interesting. On the touch-up session, I'm going to add a little bit more white, even, just to make it even more interesting. That's the good thing about touch-up sessions during portraits. There's always so much you can do. If you're somebody like me that doesn't do tattoos or doesn't do portraits just for the money, you're able to have fun with it and you're able to say, I'm finished. I like to go over it with a little bit of alcohol and a little bit of soap just to kind of get that last dot of stencil stuff off. You know, there's a little bit of purple showing through still because that stuff, like I said earlier, it works. But as far as I'm concerned, stick a fork in it because you're done. Okay, it's been three weeks since we last tattooed, so we're going to go ahead and go in today and uh, touching up the portrait. Uh, three weeks to a month is generally what I like to give for the tattoo to heal properly. So once it heals properly, it's time to get in the skin. I mean, you got to make sure the skin's healed so that when you go into it, it doesn't cause further damage or further scarring. Now I'm going to show you guys a couple of techniques that I like to use to touch up the portrait. So one of the things we want to look for before you start the touch up uh, is to make sure that there isn't any scarring any noticeable scarring that's still healing, any shiny, stretchy skin that's still in the process of healing. Uh, as you guys know, that's something you don't want to go back into uh, because it'll cause further scarring, permanent scarring, actually. So just making sure the skin's flat, not shiny, not scarring, completely healed, no scabs, of course, and uh, just ready to go. Okay, I'm going to cover this tattoo and all the uh, techniques for touching up in a way where I'm going to just go ahead and go from left to right, and I'm going to go ahead and explain as I'm working. So we'll go ahead and cover a bunch of areas. What we're going to do first is find out what's supposed to be pitch black, 100% black, and make sure that it is black by touching it up. And then also we're going to move on to what's supposed to be gray that might have faded a little bit. So always get your reference and you know have that on standby and really, really pay close attention. And I'm going to go ahead and start now. So I'm going to get into here where the black faded just a little bit. You know, I would say 100% is what we wanted. It probably faded to about 95. Part of having a perfect portrait is touching it up to where it is 100% of what you need and uh, it just makes it for a better portrait. After all the goal is to make it look as real as possible so a lot of times when you do a portrait and you see your customer and they go on their merry way and you never come, they never come back sometimes you'll run into them later on and every artist has that thought where they look at the tattoo and they know they could they know they could use a touch up but it all depends on depends on two things really it depends on what the artist is looking for as far as reputation. Um, if he wants to go the extra mile to get a good reputation, he has to go the extra mile on his tattoos and part of going the extra mile is touching up tattoos. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we charge a lot for portraits is because we have to factor in the touch-up time. Um, we don't charge them for it because, like I said, it's factored in the original price that should be at least 750 you know so keep that in mind now as we get darker into here I'm starting to notice that the hand faded a little bit just a little bit it's some of the grays should be a little bit darker grays so I'm gonna go in there and make them happen very important as you're touching up to always refer to the reference as you can see it's starting to kind of come to life again certain things that faded touching up brings back the contrast that we need and you just want to gently work it in you, you don't want to overdo anything you just gently refer to your reference back and forth we'll see what the final result is soon in my cup it faded it's kind of about a 80 percent black in the bottom of the cup it faded to about a 50 or 60. you almost want to scan the tattoo at the same time one of the main key factors really is paying a close attention to detail a lot of portrait artists instantly become 20 to 30 percent better just by following that rule paying attention to your reference and paying attention to detail the good thing about that is it doesn't require learning how to do that you know we can talk about other techniques that take time to learn how to do and master but paying attention to detail doesn't take time to learn it just takes a determination it takes a thought pattern of just knowing you have to do it and doing it 
sometimes your mood can affect your tattooing. But when you tattoo from the mode, kind of like a computer, you just do what needs to be done, you scan through it. All these contrasts we're hitting right now, it's really starting to bring it to life. Always remember, portrait tattoos need to be touched up, always. The only reason why I'm more prone to touching up portraits versus other tattoos is because we want it to fade the right way when it heals. The final result has to look like the picture, so touching up tattoos, portrait tattoos really helps with that. Make this pop a lot more by adding this dark tone, which faded. And remember, fading, has to do with a lot of things. It's not always the tattoo artist not doing the right job. Sometimes people's skin is different than others. The skin get, uh, rejects the ink, some of the ink. Uh, the healing process, maybe, you know, we, we never know what our customers do once they leave the shop. Um, but, you know, it doesn't really matter because your reputation's on the line. So whatever the case may be as to why it faded, it doesn't really matter. You just gotta know that it's faded, know how to fix it, and do it. And the benefits is them having the ability to show off a perfect portrait at the bar or at the next tattoo convention or wherever they're at. And in turn, that turns out to you getting more customers. One thing that's good to consider is some of you may need a third touch-up session. If you're not confident you can pull it off in two sessions, it doesn't hurt to go back and do another session. So now this glass is starting to pop like it's supposed to. It's looking more round and more shiny. Also, too, I'm noticing the jacket is definitely faded, so. Contrast is very important. Part of nailing that perfect contrast is in the touch-up, actually, because just when you think you got it down the first time around and it fades, it fades, it doesn't have the contrast that it should. Black's probably the most important color to pay attention to when you're doing touch-ups. You wanna make the darkest tones that you need stay dark because that's kind of what pushes every other tone off and sets every other tone off is that blackest black. A lot of times I'll start a portrait and I'll do the hair first or I'll, I'll do something that's completely black just to gauge all my other tones off of. You know, something like this, the bottom of the, of the post here, it's like just me adding this black right there makes it rounder and I'm gonna come in here right, right about here it's faded, it's sort of even tone throughout there, but on the picture it's not that way. So if I come in here, hit that really quick, I mean that little hit right there changes the look of it all. Now we're getting somewhere. This, I want to be perfectly black. It's sort of faded, but come in there with some pure black, set it off. See the contrast starting to pop now. That's partially why I like to use rotaries too, because in, in my experience with rotaries, the hit is so hard, it really packs in the ink to where the touch-ups are kind of minimal. If it's not set properly, your standard machine, there's a lot of bogging down. You know, when you're tattooing it, you know, it bogs down, it loses its power, it loses its punch, and you kind of end up working the skin too much over and over again due to the fact that it's losing its punch. And uh, you end up working the skin so hard that it rejects a lot of the ink. So this, these rotaries hit so hard that you can kind of get in and get out, minimal damage. Remember, the, the less damage you can do to put the ink in the skin, the quicker it'll heal and, and the less touch-ups you'll need. Sometimes these broad areas, they end up looking the same tone when it fades. So you gotta make sure it is a round object. So you gotta make it look that way. Some of these broad areas where it's a lot of gray and a lot of skin, they definitely need a lot of detail as far as touching up. He has a black suit on, so we're gonna darken it up just a little bit. Starting with the ends. To me, it faded to where it looks kind of like the same tone. Now we're gonna go ahead and jump back into this right here. This is pretty dark, but you know, faded just a tiny bit, just enough to where I'm not happy. I'm gonna be picky with myself and just kind of scrub over the whole dark area with pure black again. So 
Sometimes you don't realize how much it faded until you start scrubbing in the black and you start to compare it. The transition from the shadow of his jacket to his hands, little spots didn't heal properly and it doesn't look right because the hand's kind of hiding within the shadows, so I'm looking to graze over it a little bit. A lot of times it's good to use these broad wash techniques. You just kind of wash over the whole tattoo. These types of areas right here are kind of tricky. It's really, really hard to notice the subtleties of how they barely didn't make the gradient we need. This area is a 50% or a 40% gray, and we want to bump it up 5 to 10%. That's kind of tricky. You just got to kind of keep testing consistency of the water and ink until you know you got it right, and then add that extra 5 to 10%. Ear is supposed to be pitch black. That faded. Just barely the tip of the end of the glass the side. Right here, his face blends right into his jacket. There's no contrast here. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick it up by darkening the jacket, which is what we need to darken. The most important part of the touch-up is the face, especially if that's all you're doing, just a face. I mean, luckily, we have so many different elements on this on this tattoo right here, but the normal portrait is just the face, maybe a little shoulder. You just want to barely go in there and darken up what needs to be darkened. Usually, on a face, your lights are already there. It's usually the darkest darks that fade and the in-betweens that fade. Definitely don't want to overwork the face. Another thing you can do if you're not used to the mags, uh, I like to touch up sometimes with a, a 1205 needle, round liner, or a single needle, just to really, do, you know, whatever you're more comfortable with. I'm sort of, in a way, using a single needle right now, though. Actually, not sort of, I am using a single needle right now, just with my mag. Okay, we definitely have some fading on the, uh, the nose. Another reason why tattoos fade too is sometimes the clients pick or they over scrub it in the shower because it's fun. I'm guilty of it myself. You know, you're in the shower and you're scrubbing your tattoo and it's healing and it's just kind of falling off, kind of like shedded skin. I gotta always remind myself that that's not the best thing to do. Let me throw some texture in there. Getting these darks in here, these, these uh, 60 to 70% darks, makes all these other tones come to life. So it's starting to come to life even more with this. And this is basically that concept of playing with your contrast. I'm going to get a little bit more into the darks, kind of like we did on the other couple sides.
sometimes just adding the blacks, you could almost get away with the touch-ups being successful. It just kind of makes every other tone just pop out more. Just remember, patience is one of the things that will make your portrait look the best, is patience. So we're kind of winding it down, just kind of giving it that last little stretch. We're gonna touch up now the white. His white didn't fade that much at all, but we're just gonna make it to where it lasts forever. Just like the black, you don't have to get that extensive with the touch-ups. You just do what needs to be done. Remember, watering down the whites is always good. When this heals, the white's gonna look so white that it's just gonna pop the whole tattoo. So now we're gonna do a recap of uh, what we've just done. Kinda go ahead and give it a little white down and you do that last double check, just making sure you got it all. Sometimes you might have to grab the machine again. Everything looks good. We covered a lot of areas. When you look at the whole tattoo towards the end, it looks like you went through the whole thing. You know, it's just, you're adding a little to it here and there, but it's good to just cover the whole tattoo. Getting in there, the darks, the uh, lights, you know, paying attention to the darks is important. Paying attention to those middle grays is very important, always. If you constantly compare it to the reference, you're gonna find that you'll automatically know what you missed on and what's faded and what should be black or what should be gray or what should be white. The key rule here to touch-ups is just paying close attention to the reference. This tattoo's gonna heal it beautiful, but like I said, if if you guys think you might need a third one, it's not a bad thing to uh, do one more session. Usually it gets easier and easier, so if there is a third session to do, you might only need to spend five to ten minutes on it. I think the total time we spent on this touch-up was uh, maybe a good half an hour. But with all these techniques that we've applied today, this is going to heal up just perfect. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, but I cannot stress enough to you that this presentation was not just about technique, but also about responsibility to the customer. This isn't a dress rehearsal, you guys. You get one shot at doing a portrait the right way. So learn to master the portrait on paper before you attempt to master it on skin. To see more of my work, go to www.frankoviscovi.com. Also there, you'll be able to check out my new rotary tattoo machine that I designed. Thank you guys for watching, and may the force be with you.